chance to shake your hand this morning, are you? <laughs>
Uh, good to have you all here today in worship and to, to be in God's house to hear his word and to receive his gifts in the sacrament. Uh, just one announcement that I'll, I'll let you know, actually two announcements. First off, this might apply to some of you. Uh, confirmation resumes this week, confirmation students. So uh, remember, I'll see you on, on Wednesday and Bowers, we'll chat tomorrow maybe when I, I drop off, okay? Yeah, there we go. Um, and then also for those of you who uh, are uh, have been curious to know, it's written there in the wrap, uh, but as we mentioned last week, Bob Schatz was uh, called to uh, his Savior's arms on the morning of the 24th, and the services have been scheduled for Saturday, January 18th, and so you can make those uh, preparations for yourself uh, to be there. Uh, with that, the bell is calling us to worship, so I would invite you to stand and let's share the Lord's peace with one another and be sure to share your name with someone you don't know. seen each other since last year, but there it is. Yeah. Like I said, the bell has called us to worship, and so let us come before our Lord and prepare our hearts to worship, and we, and we do that in our Lutheran context by confessing our sins and hearing again God's word of forgiveness to us in Jesus. You're invited to kneel, or you may remain seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Alleluia. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Alleluia. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. God bless your worship here today.
Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of all righteousness. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Sacrifice and offering you have not desired. For an offering and sin offering you have not required. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. In those who hope in his steadfast love. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore nations will praise you forever and ever. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. And the darkness of the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you. And his glory will be seen upon you. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen Glory is of the only Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. you. Let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives. Lead us who know you by faith to enjoy in, in heaven the fullness of your divine presence. In this new year, abide among us with your Holy Spirit, that we may always trust in the saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be Neat song that we just sang about 
God loves me dearly. What a great thing. You can say every single day, God loves me dearly. Well, I have something special right here. It's a treasure box, a treasure chest, that's right. So what goes inside of a treasure box? Gold or something precious, something that I, I wanna keep safe and tucked away. I'll put it inside and lock it up so no one can get in. So if I had something, I would go, wait a minute, it's how do I get it in? Oh, I have to have the lock undone. Okay, so I would have a, a key and I would, okay, so I unlocked it, now. Oh, I gotta open it. Oh, that's right. Okay, so in order to put something in the treasure chest, you gotta open it. All right, wow, yeah, you have to open it. And then you can put all your gold and all of your jewels and all your fancy things in there, and then you can close it up so that no one else gets it, unless they have the key and they can open it up. But that's the thing. In order to put something in the treasure chest, you gotta open it. Today in our gospel reading, Today in our gospel reading, Jesus' mom does something interesting, it says. They came and they found Jesus in the temple, which is a great place to be, worshiping God. And while he was there, Jesus was teaching the teachers. And Mary thought, wow, what a great boy have I. She's got a great son. And she says, it says that she treasured up all these things. She treasured up all these things in her heart. Which you know what that means? In order for her to treasure it up, what did she have to do? She had to open her heart. Her heart had to be open for her to treasure these things, to keep them sacred, to, to remember them, and to treasure them. But you know what? God wants, to, wants us to treasure him in our hearts. He wants us to remember all the things that he has done for us. He wants us to have faith in our hearts. And you know what? In order to do that, we have to open our hearts as well. But the problem is, we can't. We don't have the ability on our own to open our hearts. And so God sent the Holy Spirit. It's like that key to open up the treasure box of our heart. Yeah, there's only one key, and it's, you're right, it's a picture inside of the, the treasure box. I don't know how it got in there. But anyway, so God sends the Holy Spirit to open our hearts so that we can believe in Jesus and so that we can have eternal life in him. And so we treasure up all these things with open hearts by the Holy Spirit's power. Let's thank God for that and all the gifts that he gives to us. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who opens our hearts to give us faith. <coughs> In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats.
from the first chapter of Ephesians, the writing of St. Paul to the church of Ephesus. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through the, his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, all nations. Him, all to us a child is born. To us a son is given. For great is his steadfast love toward us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and protector of our faith. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, 
They found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Let us now confess our Christian faith together in the words of the ancient Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our message hymn. mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Exercise more. Lose weight. Learn a new skill or hobby. Live life to the fullest. Save money. Spend less money. Quit smoking. Spend more time with family and friends. Travel more. Read more. Doing just a quick Google search, these were the top 10 New Year's resolutions that people make, apparently, according to Google. It's possible that you might have made a similar New Year's resolution among that list of 10, but it's also possible, sorry, that you'll be, un you'll be among the 92% of Americans who will not succeed in your New Year's resolution. Sorry to say, because statistically, only 8% of Americans actually succeed in fulfilling their New Year's resolution. Only 8%. 
And yet, no matter how many times we fall into that 92% failure category, we keep on doing this to ourselves year after year. This year is going to be different, we tell ourselves, convinced that we will make our resolutions into realities. And why not? With a new year comes new opportunities, new challenges, new experiences, and more. The new year is a sort of gateway to the unknown days and months ahead of us. But with a year like 2020, I mean, this is low-hanging fruit. Perhaps we should focus less upon resolutions and more upon our vision for the new year. What is your 2020 vision? Your 2020 vision, that's going to be our focus for the month of January as we study the book of Ephesians together. Because whenever you begin something, it's always wise to start with a vision, a plan for how you anticipate things to go and how to accomplish something. Now, I'm not talking about a vision of an organizational or institutional type of vision, like for a church or a business, nor am I talking about something like dreams and revelations or things like that. I'm talking about you, the individual person in the pew. What is your 2020 vision? So just think about it, sit back and imagine as I ask you a few questions, where do you see yourself at the end of 2020? How do you see this year playing out for you? Where do you see this year going? And how do you see yourself growing in 2020? What is your 2020 vision? Now, I'm going to guess that if you were actually playing along and answering those questions in your mind, most of you answered those questions in terms of one of those 10 resolutions that I listed. Lose weight, travel more, spend less money, save more money, etc. Maybe, though, you answered it in terms of your professional career or, or maybe your family and your marriage relationships or any number of ways you could have thought of. Those are all good things to set a vision for your year. And this life. But what didn't make that top 10 list and what often gets overlooked or taken for granted and what I want to focus on is what is your 2020 vision for your faith life and for your life as a disciple and follower of Jesus. So now think back to those questions again. Where do you see yourself at the end of 2020 in terms of your faith life? How do you see this year playing out for you in terms of your worship and your devotional life? Where do you see this year going in terms of how deep into God's word you're going to go? And how do you see yourself growing this year as a disciple and follower of Jesus? What is your 2020 vision? In our reading from Ephesians chapter 1, which I would encourage you, if you want to look at it, you can check out the Pew Bible or it's there in your, in your bulletin. For you to look at. In our, in our reading from Ephesians 1, we learn that God is actually a planner too. God makes plans. God has a vision for his people. Uh, these are plans that he envisioned from the foundations of the world. God's visions go deep. He had a vision for how creation would look and appear even before he spoke it into being. It wasn't as if he said, let there be light, and thought, huh, so that's light. What do you know? No, he had a plan in place when he created everything. Whenever he created things like watermelons and tarantulas and chihuahuas and seaweed and narwhals and bamboo and even duckbill platypus, God had a plan in place, a vision for each of these creaturely things. God had a vision and he put it into action. But ultimately, God's vision concerned us. God's vision was concerning you. That vision was that you would be with him forever. That's God's vision for you, that you would be with him forever. And so Paul writes in our reading, blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as, get this, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. God chose us before the foundation of the world. Think about that. 
Even as God was decorating the night sky, hanging stars in outer space, setting moons and planets in perpetual orbit, God was thinking about being with you forever. And then even as God was going along and cre getting creative with designing these massive wild beasts, as well as the microscopic bacteria, God was thinking about being with you forever. And then even as God was tunneling through the dirt to form veins and organs in the first man, God was thinking about you and being with you for eternity. God chose us before the foundation of the world, and he's been thinking of us ever since. Of course, we know that you can plan and plan and plan, but inevitably something happens. Sometimes good, but not always. Life doesn't always go the way we plan or envision or expect. There's a reason why many of us fall into that 92% category of failure with our New Year's resolutions, right? And so at first we might think that the same thing happened to God and his vision for us, that God's vision failed, that his plans were thwarted. Because while God desires to be with us, sin gets in the way. Sin separates us from him. So then we're left thinking, maybe he must not be much of a God if he didn't see that whole sin thing coming. Or maybe we're left thinking that he must not be a loving God if he is purposefully creating others who would sin and suffer and die and be separated from him for eternity. In reality, God saw sin and Satan coming light years away. See, it's not that God's plans were thwarted, nor that he was blindsided in his vision. And it's not that God wanted sin and suffering of millions. It's that his vision included a response. His vision included a reaction to sin's inevitable entry. And he went for it anyway in order to get to you. And so Paul goes on. He writes, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. There's a lot of great words in there, words of grace, God's riches lavished upon us. Such wonderful, beautiful language that Paul's using here. He's showing us God's vision, saying things like God's purpose and his will, his plan for the fullness of time. But there's one word that's in there that sometimes trips us up, and that word is predestined. Don't get hung up on that word predestined here. It's not as if God was going around creating and then reviewing people like an assembly line inspector. Saved, saved, not saved, definitely not saved, saved. That's not how it was. No, that sort of Calvinistic predestination is not what Paul is referring to. No, Paul is referring to what scripture has already revealed elsewhere. That God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of him. He's referring to the fact that God's grace and mercy is extended to all people of all time and in all places. God's grace is right there, ready for the taking. That's what he's predestined for us. Paul's referring to the fact that God so loved the world that he was ready to give his only son, even before sin and death entered the scene. He's referring to the fact that all the while, while Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking of being with you in eternity. And to him, it was worth it. See, Christ's death was all part of God the Father's vision from the foundation of the world, finally coming to fruition in the fullness of time on the cross. And so now, through the lens of Christ, the Father sees us as his own children. You see, God imagined you before he even began creating everything. He imagined you, and just the idea of being with you forever excited God so much that there was nothing that could stop him from continuing on in his creative. He saw all the bad things that were going to happen, but he wanted to be with you so badly, he went for it anyway. Making it happen, including sending his son. 
Now, we don't fully understand how this is, nor do we fully understand how there are still some who believe and some who don't believe. We don't understand it, and that's okay. That's why Paul refers to it as the mystery of his will. It's a mystery to us because we are simple human beings. See, the problem isn't that God is unloving, nor that his vision was flawed. The problem is that while God wants to be with us for eternity, the feeling is not mutual. At least not by our sinful nature. The feeling is not mutual. No, we are far more inclined to turn ourselves away from God. We're more inclined to focus on ourselves and on our own well-being and on our own desires. That's why even as Christians, as people who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, even our New Year's resolutions focus more on ourselves, on our weight, on our hobbies, on our money, on living your best life. All of that, rather than focusing on our relationship with God or living as a disciple of Jesus. But of course, God anticipated all of this too. He saw it come. So he didn't just leave us to try to figure things out on our own, to figure out how to believe in Jesus, to figure out how to muster up faith. No, God saw that coming, and so he sent a helper along. And Paul writes about this too. He writes, in Christ, you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. God gave his Holy Spirit to you, and the Holy Spirit is the one who's working faith in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the one who fixes our eyes on Jesus until his glorious return. And yet, of course, in our Lutheran theology, in our Lutheran understanding, we understand that we are simultaneously saints and sinners. And so while our eyes are fixed on Jesus by faith, at the same time, we're tempted to look away. We get distracted. And so again, we need a plan. We need a vision. We need someone to guide us along to grow in our faith in Jesus rather than look away. And that's why Paul prays for the Ephesians. And this is my prayer for you too. The prayer is this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Now you've already got the Holy Spirit because you believe in Jesus, but now he's asking for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's the same spirit, but he's going deeper with it. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Some translations say opened. The eyes of your heart opened. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. See, Paul's prayer is essentially that the Holy Spirit would continue to work in the hearts of the Ephesians and in the hearts of all Christians. Paul's prayer is that Christians would grow in their faith through the means of grace given to them. Because through the hearing of Scripture, through the body and blood in Holy Communion, through the waters of baptism, through our hymns and our prayers, and even through the fellowship of believers, through it all, the Holy Spirit opens our hearts and opens our eyes to see God's vision for us, to see his design for our daily Christian living, and to see his grace continually given in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is ready to work in and through you to better and more fully know and love this triune God who desperately wants to be with you in eternity. And the only thing that's preventing that from happening is us. Because we can pray and pray that the Holy Spirit would work in us, that the Spirit would strengthen us all we want. But if we're not actively taking the steps to be in the Word, To be in worship, no matter what. To be in fellowship with other Christians. We're not being active in these things. We are limiting the growth that the Holy Spirit desires in us. So again, I'm asking, what is your 2020 vision for Christian growth? Holy Trinity Lutheran Church's mission statement is a familiar one. It's the Great Commission. We can summarize it in these words. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. But that's not just my job as your pastor. That's your job, too. That's the job of the church. Some have put it this way. Uh, It's not that uh, God's church has a mission. It's that God's mission has a church. And that's us. 
We have uh, a mission. God's mission has a church, and we are sent out to go and make disciples. It's the responsibility of us all to make disciples. So, what is a disciple? At its root, at its most basic, a disciple is a student. A disciple is one who learns the disciplines of someone they follow. A disciple is a follower of a teacher. So even before John the Baptist came along, the way of showing that you were a disciple was this thing called baptism. A person would be baptized, and it would be symbolic to show that I am washing away this old life of mine. I am washing away that life, and I am leaving it all behind to follow you, Rabbi. I'm fixing my eyes on you, Rabbi. And then that disciple would dedicate him, him or herself to learning as much as possible from the teacher. A disciple is willing to put everything else on the line for the chance to be with the teacher. As Lutherans, we know that baptism is more than a symbol. It's beyond just that symbolic nature. Baptism now saves you, Peter writes. We are baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we live in that gospel truth. In your baptism, your old life has been washed away, and you are called to leave that old life behind. You're called as a disciple. You're called to be dedicated to learning as much as possible from the teacher, not relegating your faith life and your faith time to one hour a week in worship. As a disciple, you are called to put everything else on the line for the chance to be with the teacher whenever possible. Not pushing off opportunities to be in a Bible study or to have a personal devotion because it's not convenient. As a disciple of Jesus, you are called to go and make disciples. Not disciples of sports or political ideologies or of leisurely activities or anything else. You're called to make disciples of Jesus. And that starts in your home. Because your kids and your grandkids, even your neighbors, see you and they see what you think is important in life. And they'll start to reflect that. So what's your 2020 vision? I know I said I'm talking about your personal vision for spiritual growth, but let me tell you Holy Trinity's vision statement. So as we're trying to make disciples of all nations, as we're trying to do what Christ has commanded us, which is love God, love one another, love your neighbor, as we're trying to do these things through our uh, activities and events, through our Bible studies and worship, in the end, what we hope to see is this. This is our vision statement. We will equip followers of Jesus to be powerful witnesses of the gospel in their everyday lives, in our homes, in our communities, in our nation, and around the world. So as a church organization, we are here to make disciples through word and sacrament ministry. It's happening right now. We are here to equip you beyond the one hour a week to make disciples, to be a disciple, to be living faithfully in Christ in the world. And to that end, let me tell you about our sermon series that we're going to be having throughout this year. This month of January, we're going to be focusing on your 2020 vision. We're going to go even deeper into the book of Ephesians each and every week. I know it was a long reading. There's more to come. Brace yourselves. In February, we're going to have a series called Some Assembly Required. We're going to be focusing on what it means to be a church member and the importance of gathering as a church. Because some assembly is required. Throughout the season of Lent, we're going to be looking at a book called The Red Letter Challenge, and we're going to be looking at those red letters in your Bible and consider what does it actually mean if we took Jesus' words seriously. And throughout the year, we're going to have uh, several other series. In early fall, we're going, to have, uh, we're going to look at family and home life and what that looks like as Christians. In November, we're going to have a financial stewardship series. And focus on what it means to have godly giving in all aspects of our life. These and several other areas, we're going to be focusing our lives so that you can be equipped to be disciples. So you can be equipped to be a powerful witness of the gospel in your everyday life. So those are some next steps for you. Along the way, we've got various other resources for you to consider. We're starting up again our devotional booklets. There are some there in the narthex in that basket. And so you can take those devotion booklets home. They're based and geared around our sermon series. If that's not enough, we've got Portals of Prayer, which is another devotional outlet for you. Pastor Hinkey has been doing these barkings from your German shepherd, these videos that are 
three to five minutes long or so that are just inspirational bits for you each and every week. You can find them on Facebook or on our website. We have Right Now Media, which is an online video-based resource for you that you can use in your homes so that you can have Christ conversations in your home. And we have various Bible studies and small groups for you to look into. And if you can't find one that suits you, we can create another one. We're always willing to start more. And if you're already doing these things, maybe the next step for you is to serve in the church in a new way. Maybe the next step for you is leading a small group Bible study. Maybe it's writing devotions for our weekly uh, devotional booklet. Whatever the case is, whatever the next step is, opportunities abound in this place. And if there's anything that I or our staff or our elders can do to assist you, we're here for you because we're here to make disciples. And we want you to live as a disciple. Now, I don't know what this year is going to hold for us. I don't know what it's going to look like. But I know that the Holy Spirit is ready to work in and through each and every single one of us to open our eyes, to open our hearts, to better know and love our triune God. And by the grace and the Holy Spirit's work among us, may we say with confidence, this year is going to be different. So may we, by faith, be receptive to the Christ's leading, and may our 2020 vision be his 2020 vision. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. We sing our hymn. come before God's throne of grace with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, as we journey through this new year, grant to us spiritual renewal to live in your grace by your Holy Spirit's power. Open our eyes to see your great blessings with each new day. Open our hearts to grow in our faith in Jesus and through every experience of this new year, increase in us our love for you, that we may better love one another in the body of Christ, and so also mercifully love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord of the nations and Prince of Peace, graciously look upon our government and courts, preserve our nation and state and justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity, Grant health and favor to all those who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and the Legislature of Oklahoma, 
and all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. And Heavenly Father, you are the God of all concord. It is your gracious will that your children on earth would live together in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of all who would stir up violence and strife. Destroy the weapons of those who delight in war and bloodshed. And according to your will, and end all conflicts in the world. As tensions mount again in the Middle East, we pray for a lasting peace and for resolutions which would preserve the lives of the innocent, reduce and eliminate casualties, and also bring an end to all of the political maneuvering which further divide nations and citizens. Preserve us from all danger, give courage to our military, and change the hearts of our enemies that together we may walk in sincerity and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord of life, we pray for those marking another year of life as they celebrate birthdays this week. For Hunter Bimley, Lance Gibbons, Taylor Fannin-Steel, Katie DeMercurio, Katie Enert, Kathy Jackson, Matthew Carver, Stephen Parker, David Bailey, Carol Garner, Roger Bradford, Laura Finlayson, Don McHugh, Tori McHugh, Robbie Wyckoff, Jacob Beeman, Paul Brinkman, Laura Endicott, and Susan McCall. Let them continue to experience your blessings, and may they be a blessing through every aspect of their earthly life. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord of love, we pray for those celebrating marriage blessings this week as they mark anniversaries. Tim and Heather Dewitt, Dan and Cheryl Rood, Robert and Megan Lee, and John and Jerry Parkinson, who celebrate 48 years of marriage. Let the love of each of these couples grow stronger through every joy and sorrow experienced until that day when one shall lay the other into your arms for eternity. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And great physician of body and soul, embrace with your mercy those in need of your healing and comfort. We continue to bring before you Grace and Barger, Linda Bradford, George Breach, Neil and Carol Ford, Nathan Johnson, Lynn Klein, Melinda Morris, Carly Nampkin, Rita Paul, Gary and Michelle Quick, Becky Borrell, and all others on our prayer list and in our hearts. We, you know their needs, O oh Lord, so we pray your healing power would attend them according to their need of body, soul, or mind. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And God of all comfort, we lift up to you all those mourning the loss of a loved one, especially remembering Elsie Schatz and her family as they continue to grieve the death of her husband, Bob, for Brad and Marianne Gares and family as they mourn the tragic passing of Brad's younger sister, Kelly Gatz, and for the saints in Christ of West Freeway Church of Christ in Fort Worth, Texas, who grieve and recover from the shooting and worship last Sunday. In the midst of such loss, let the healing counsel and consolation of the Holy Spirit direct all who mourn to see Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, to all who believe. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, let us worship our Lord by receiving our offerings and our tithes.
Heavenly Father, receive now these gifts that we offer to you as symbols that we give our hearts and our lives to your mission and to your ministry. Use us in all that we are and have to extend the kingdom of Jesus Christ throughout the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are privileged once again to celebrate the gift of God's grace coming to us in a very real and special way as he brings to us his very body and blood veiled in earthly elements of bread and wine to reaffirm to us that we are his forgiven children and that we also are strengthened to live our life each day of this new year to his glory and in the work of discipling. Let's stand as we celebrate his gift. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have given us a new revelation of your glory, that seeing you in the person of your Son, we may know and love those things which are not seen. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your grace poured out in his body and his blood on the cross. So hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church forever and ever. Amen. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ shall come again. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with Welcome to the Lord. 
marriage table.
welcome to the Lord's table. to serve him with joy and to live in his peace in this new year and always. Amen. Forgive and have by the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ. Go in his peace and his joy and serve him in this new year.
this holy eating and drinking strengthen you and keep you in the true faith until life everlasting departed is peace. Amen. Let's stand for our closing prayer and blessing. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. God's peace, everyone.